In the last video, we discussed how we can use our four-step procedure for solving a differential equation using the eigenfunctions of its differential operator. This is analogous to the procedure we had in chapter two for solving a system of linear algebraic equations with a symmetric coefficient matrix. Here, the differential operator needs to be self-adjoint, which we'll talk about in a later video. We're going to use an example to illustrate this four-step process, step one in this video and steps two, three, and four in the next video. As a caution at the end of the last video, we need to be a little bit careful when we introduce a method by showing an example. The tendency is to get bogged down in the details. Keep the big picture in mind, focus on the overall steps, and you can go back and look at the details later on. Here is our example. So the differential equation we want to solve is d squared u dx squared is equal to a known f of x function. Now obviously if f of x is of certain forms, we can simply integrate twice, get the solution, and we're done. And we don't need this method. However, if we have more complicated f of x functions, and eventually we'll have more complicated differential operators as well. But we want to use this simple example to illustrate the four-step process for getting the solution using this eigenfunction expansion approach. The boundary conditions are that at x is equal to 0, u is 0, and at x is equal to 1 u is also zero. Remember, we need to have homogeneous boundary conditions in order for us to use this approach. We'll address in a later video how to deal with situations where we do not have homogeneous boundary conditions. So the first step, which is going to occupy us for this current video, is to take the differential operator from our differential equation, extract it out, and then form its eigenproblem. So the differential operator is d squared dx squared, so we form the eigenproblem L u sub n is equal to lambda n u sub n, where now the L is our d squared dx squared differential operator. We're going to solve this as a differential equation. So remember, as I've emphasized previously, the eigenproblem itself is a differential equation that we will solve using those techniques. However, it is not the original differential equation that we seek the solution of. So we're forming a new problem, the differential eigenproblem, in order to get our basis functions, which are the eigenfunctions of the differential operator, to then use in order to solve the given differential equation, in, in this case, equation 3.8. So as I said, we'll be using the general techniques for solving differential equations in order to solve this differential eigenproblem. We do need to keep in mind here, however, that lambda can be anything right at this point. We're looking for the values of lambda that give us non-trivial solutions, u sub n of x, those are the eigenfunctions. But at this point, lambda can be anything. It could be positive, negative, it could be zero. So we need to consider all those possible cases when we look for the general solutions of our differential eigenproblem. So let's first focus on the case when lambda is equal to zero. If lambda is zero, then the right-hand side is gone, and we simply have d squared u n dx squared. We integrate that twice, and we simply get a straight line, c1 x plus c2. We substitute in the boundary conditions, so at x is equal to 0, which gets rid of this term. u is equal to 0, so therefore c2 has to be 0, c2 is 0. Likewise, at x is equal to 1, u is also 0, so when you put in 1 for x, with c2 being 0, and u now being 0 as well from the homogeneous boundary condition, we get that c1 also has to be zero. So we get the trivial solution for u sub n. We don't care about trivial solutions, we set that aside, and we'll move on to the other two possible cases. So lambda is equal to zero gives us the trivial solution. Let's next try the case where lambda is positive. So lambda is greater than zero. So you can go ahead and solve our differential eigen problem where we recognize that lambda is positive. However, what I prefer to do is set lambda equal to, in this case, plus mu sub n squared, which of course for any mu is always positive. That way I don't have to remember that lambda is positive. Besides, we're going to get square roots of lambda all over the place, so this way we'll just have mu sub n's. Uh, you'll see how that works out, but either way is perfectly fine. So if lambda is plus mu sub n squared, when we bring that over from the right hand side to the left hand side, we'll have minus lambda sub n times u sub n, which is now minus mu sub n squared u sub n. So this is a second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients. The general solution of that is an e to the rx. 
we substitute that into our differential equation. We get an algebraic equation for r. It's r squared plus mu squared is equal to zero. We factor that and we get that the two values of r are plus and minus mu sub n. So the general solution, u sub n of x, is an integration constant times e to the mu sub n times x plus another integration constant times e to the minus mu sub n times x. Now this exponential form we generally use when we have infinite or semi-infinite domains because of the exponential behavior. If we have a finite domain as we do here, we prefer to use the equivalent trigonometric form, in this case, cosh and cinch. There's no i's in the exponentials, so it's not sine and cosine, it's cosh and cinch of mu sub n times x. So even though these are mathematically equivalent, the rule of thumb is if we have a finite domain, we will prefer to use this form in terms of trig functions. All right, so that's what we're gonna do. We put in the boundary conditions, so again, at x is equal to zero, u is equal to zero. Cinch at zero is zero, cosh at zero is one. So that requires that C3 be zero. U at x is equal to one is also zero, but C3 has already been determined to be zero. So that means we have zero is equal to C4 times cinch of mu, because x is equal to one. But in order for cinch to be equal to zero, mu would also have to be zero. But that's the case we already considered when lambda is zero. So again, this just gives us trivial solutions. Now we're done with this particular case, but let me show you a different way to formulate it, which actually is a little bit more helpful in seeing the characteristic equation in this case. So we could take this form here and think of this as a two by two matrix for the constants C3 and C4 in which case we have our two by two matrix of its coefficients, one, zero, cosh mu, cinch mu, times C3, C4, and that's equal to zero. So in order for this homogeneous system of equations to have a non-trivial solution, the two by two matrix would have to have a zero determinant. So that determinant is one times cinch minus zero times cosh is equal to zero. So cinch, again, is equal to zero, come to the same conclusion as we did before. So this is just an equivalent matrix form to get our characteristic equation. All right, so lambda is equal to zero, gives us trivial solutions, lambda positive gives us trivial solutions. So let's consider the case when lambda is negative. So I'm gonna say lambda is now minus mu sub n squared, which of course is always zero regardless of the sign of mu. So then we have u double prime plus mu squared u is equal to zero. Because of the plus sign, when we substitute in the e to the rx, the general solution, we get r squared plus mu squared is equal to zero, which factors into r plus and minus i mu sub n. And so our general solution is now constants of integration times e to the minus i mu sub n times x plus e to the i mu sub n times x. Once again, we would use this form for semi-infinite or infinite domains, we prefer the equivalent trigonometric form if we have a finite domain, as in this case. So because of the presence of the i's, this is now a cosine and a sine of mu times x. So we'll use this form uh, going forward. Put in the boundary conditions, x equals zero, u is zero. So sine of zero, of course, is zero. Cosine of zero is one. So we have that zero is equal to C5. In the second boundary condition, we have u sub n at one is equal to zero. So put in one for x, and we have zero is equal to C6 sine of mu sub n. Again, this first term is gone because C5 is zero. So that gives us our characteristic equation. As I did in the previous case, we could also view this in matrix form. Look at these two equations. For two unknowns, we have the coefficient matrix the two unknowns in the homogeneous right-hand side. Take the determinant, one times sine minus zero times cosine, and that determinant has to be equal to zero to get a non-trivial solution. So that gives us our characteristic equation, which is one times sine minus zero times cosine, so that sine of mu is equal to zero. So that's the characteristic equation. Now, in the matrix case, of course, the characteristic equation was a polynomial of degree n, n being the size 
of the matrix. Now we have an infinity of eigenvalues, so an infinity of mu values. So that means we have to have a transcendental equation for the characteristic equation. Transcendental is just a fancy way of saying it's not a polynomial function, essentially. Okay, so what are the values of mu for which sine of mu is equal to zero? Well, any integer multiple of pi, right? Positive or negative integer multiple of pi. So mu is then n times pi, where n is all the positive integers. We don't need the zero because that gives us the trivial solution. We saw that before. And we actually don't need the negative values of n, negative integers, because they give us the same eigenfunctions as we'll get for positive. I'll show you that in a moment. Okay, so the eigenvalues, we have lambda is minus mu squared, but now we know that mu is n pi, so lambda is minus n squared pi squared. So those are the infinity of eigenvalues of this differential operator. Likewise, the eigenfunctions we had from back here, our general solution, but C5 was zero. So our general eigenfunctions are constant times sine of mu times x. So those are our eigenfunctions, sine n pi x, where n is all the positive integers. Now just emphasize the subscript. So I'm putting subscripts on the lambda, the mu, and in particular the u, in order to indicate that there are many of these, in fact an infinity of them, and it also distinguishes the u sub n's, which are the eigenfunctions, from the solution u. So u is the solution of the differential equation, u sub n are all the eigenfunctions of the differential operator, which we'll use to get the solution u. Now let me just show you, as I said a moment ago, that if I take the negative value of n, I actually get back the same eigenfunction as the positive value. So let's look at u sub n which is c6 times sine of n pi x, and then u sub minus n. So that would be c6 sine of minus n pi x. But sine of a negative number is just the negative of the sine of that number. So we just get back the negative of the eigenfunction. So we haven't introduced a new eigenfunction, it's just the negative one that we already have, and of course you can multiply any constant times an eigenfunction, and it's still an eigenfunction. So we don't need to keep the negative values in this case. All right, so we have our eigenfunctions. We can choose the C6 in a number of ways. We could just say, well, let's make it one to make it convenient. We could choose C6 such that our eigenfunctions are normalized over this domain, which is what we're gonna do here. That'll just be convenient for later steps in the process. So in order for the norm of U sub n to be one, so it'd be normalized, of course, that's the same as the norm squared being one, just so we don't have to take square roots. So we have the norm, which is the inner product of un with itself, so the integral of un squared from zero to one, and that integral has to be equal to one. Well, put in the u sub n, that's c6 times sine of n pi x, the integral of sine squared of n pi x over the interval from zero to one is a half. It's just a definite integral, you can evaluate that. So that's a half. So c6 squared is equal to two and c6 is equal to the square root of two. So by using this as our coefficient in the eigenfunctions, we'll have orthonormalized eigenfunctions. Now I haven't established how we know that the eigenfunctions are orthogonal. We'll do that later, uh, but they are, and we'll take advantage of that here. But now we've also normalized them. So the normalized eigenfunctions are square root of two times sine of n pi x. And, and of course, these are then Fourier sine series as we saw in a previous video. So then just to remind you, the eigenvalues, the lambdas are minus n squared pi squared along with the eigenfunctions. So that's step one. Let me just make a few remarks about this step one part of the process. And then in the next video, we'll look at steps two, three, and four. As you'll see, step one is the most time consuming portion of these problems, steps two, three, and four are relatively straightforward once we have the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. So just some remarks here. So we can put in, just as we did for the algebraic case, we can put in any value of lambda. It's just an arbitrary parameter. However, what we're saying is for most values of lambda, we simply get a trivial solution for u sub n. What we're looking for are the values of lambda that give us non-trivial solutions. Those are the eigenvalues of the differential operator. The corresponding u sub n's are the eigenfunctions of that same differential operator. Now, if we change anything about the differential operator, the differential operator itself, 
the domain, the boundary conditions, if we change any of those things, then we have to go back and re-evaluate the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. They depend on all three of those things, the differential operator, the domain, as well as the boundary conditions. If it so happened that more than one of our lambda cases produced non-trivial solutions, then we would simply superimpose them because these are linear equations. We can superimpose multiple solutions to get the most general solution. And as you'll see, we're going to take advantage in steps two, three, and four of the orthogonality of our eigenfunctions. Once again, we have not established that yet, but we will establish later on how we know that's the case here without explicitly checking for orthogonality.